All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 23rd day of April in the year of our Lord, 2022. And at last, I think uh, the insanity about Ukraine is beginning to to uh, damp down a little bit. Well, we'll see. Strange things are going on. Uh, in the 20th century, the world order was overthrown at least twice. First World War and the Second World War. Actually, they were sort of a continuum, but with a little bit of a breather in between. For some people, it wasn't a breather. But uh, the, uh, yeah, it was a continuation of the First World War in a lot of ways. But the Second World War, I believe that was actually fulfilled the, the first, the four seals, first four seals in the book of Revelation. Because you have uh, you have these uh, the spirit the first one the w rider on the white horse goes forth conquering and to conquer. These aren't individuals; these are spirits. So you have uh, actually by happenstance apparently you have four um, powers that go forth four empires or four uh, kingdoms going forth conquering and to conquer. The, the Germans and the Italians and the Japanese and the, and the Soviets. Soviets. I don't really want to say Russians. Soviets. It's been said, I think, uh, was it Solzhenitsyn that said it, that uh, communism was an imposition on the Russian soul. Yeah, it doesn't come from Russia. It was a, it was a foreign ideology that was imp exported to Russia by the Germans. <laughs> uh, not solely by them, but, uh, but they sent Lenin back into Russia. And of course, uh, Marx was a, uh, from Germany, and, and Engels was from England. But so it's, it's a Western European ideology that was exported as a weapon by the Germans in the First World War into Russia. History has some strange twists and turns. Yeah, and it found uh, fertile ground there for a reason. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the two Christianities, the two churches. And this has been a long time, thinking on this has been a long time developing. I mean, my entire Christian life, which is like 45 years as a born-again, Bible-believing Christian. Now, I had a form of Christianity before that, sort of a form of Christianity. That was uh, neither this nor that in a lot of ways. But there, there's really the original Christianity, the, the biblical Christianity, the Christianity that's revealed in the New Testament in this book, is... What was born in Christ, but you could say it, it the the uh, the coming of the new covenant, the coming of the promises of what Christ accomplished on the cross began at the at Pentecost, uh, fifty days after his resurrection, or after his crucifixion. Let's say, yeah. Uh, so. What we call in the in uh, Amer in the Anglo West Easter, which is a wicked perversion. It's derived Easter is derived from the name the goddess Astarte, a pagan deity. Yikes! It's only in the English speaking world too. 
In, in Spanish, it's Pascua, Passover, which isn't quite correct either. Among Bible-believing Christians, we usually prefer Resurrection Sunday. That's, that's a better term. Uh, anyway, uh, of course, which is the holiest day of the uh, Christian calendar, if you're into calendars. And this Sunday, the 24th, will be the uh, the Orthodox Christian uh, Resurrection Sunday. So, I think it's the first Sunday after, what is it, the full moon? You know, the spring equinox and the uh, full moon. Let's see, how it's related to Passover in a calendar, but... At the moment, that's not my t subject, so I'd have to. I'm not um, thinking along those lines. But the two Christianities, the, the original Christianity, Jesus said, "You must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit." He was speaking that to believing a believing Jew, a believing Rabbi. So this is something beyond a uh, a knowledge, a natural knowledge of God and God's revelation and God's law and God's justice and righteousness and mercy and grace. It's beyond that. Something you can't simply teach someone. Because as Jesus said, quoting the prophets, they shall be all they shall all be taught of God. By God. As Peter was. You know, Jesus said, Blessed art thou, uh, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. When, when uh, Jesus asked his disciples, Who do you say that I am? And Peter blurted out, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. By the way, that's the rock on which the church is built. On that confession. On Christ himself. That he is the Son of the living God. Not on Peter. <sighs> there's a reason for that distinction too. But there's so the, the the original church was we could say it, it's coming beyond from eternity, but it, it's God's plan. But it's uh, Christ coming into the world, Christ finishing His work, Christ dying for the sins of the world. Christ ascending into heaven, and then Christ outpouring the Spirit, which is one of the promises of the new covenant. You know, the at the Last Supper, they took the cup of wine and said, this is the blood of the new covenant. He came to establish the new covenant, which was prophesied in uh, many places in the Old Testament, but particularly in Jeremiah chapter 31, uh, uh, starting about verse 31-ish, uh, which is also quoted in the, in the New Testament uh, book of Hebrews, and also in Ezekiel 36, beginning about verse 26, that, that God would make a new covenant. Now, in Ezekiel, it's not mentioned by name, but it is mentioned by name in Jeremiah. But the promise of God giving his spirit to everyone, all his people, is mentioned in Ezekiel 36, which identifies that as part of the new covenant. Because the Holy Spirit is not poured out on everyone, only those who belong to Christ. See, the, the apostles prior to Pentecost weren't partakers of the fullness of the Spirit. He was with them, but not abiding in them. That, that, that's why there was a, a, a definite change in character and boldness and faith when the Spirit was outpoured. Before that, they were timid and hiding power of God, the uh, the authority of God, the, the presence of God in them. In the New Testament, the Apostle Paul makes that the mark of Christianity. You are a Christian if you know, or if the Spirit abides in you. Now, you should know that. You should recognize that, although it's not it's not like it's obvious, necessarily, but uh, you should come to recognize that. That, that uh, and you do. You have a, a it's a it's a living, vital relationship with God through Jesus Christ, that it was made possible by Jesus' death, 
that that was uh, made evident that that he accomplished his purpose of atoning for the sins of the world by his resurrection. He couldn't have rose from the dead if he hadn't accomplished that purpose. Because the sins of the, of humanity was put on him, if they still remained on him, or if he had any personal sin, he could not have risen from the dead. He would because he was born under the law. He had to deal with the penalty of the law, which is the wages of sin is death. So. Uh, but that's the, the original Christianity. That's New Testament Christianity. That's the oldest form of Christianity. What's in this book? That, that's apostolic Christianity. It, and it dates, it, and the last, the, the newest book in this Bible is, uh, let's see, over 1900 years old. Dates back to oh, the mid 90s AD. 95, 96. So you have the, uh, the, the writings of John were the last, or at least especially the book of Revelation is generally considered the last book written. Although I've seen the Orthodox put the Gospel of John there. Uh, anyway, uh, We know that, this is, I don't want to get into that side issue. I have a habit of going to rabbit trails. But that's the original Christianity. And, and in the original Christianity, through by faith in Jesus Christ, by calling out to God to save you, believing that Jesus is the Messiah, that what Jesus, he is the Son of God, and he has risen from the dead. And calling out to God to save you from your sin. God does a miraculous work in us. He gives us a new spirit and a new heart. And he gives us his Holy Spirit. And he forgives us all our sins. And we have a and we become the children of God. Literally. Born of the Word of God. Born of his spirit. As Paul says, we become new creatures in Christ. That's original Christianity. That's supernatural Christianity. That's spiritual Christianity. That's true Christianity. And it has to do with the individual and your relationship with God. A living relationship, not just a, a status a change in category in the books of heaven, but God dwelling in you. You become, quite literally, a temple of God. And that is his church, too. The church is the temple of the living God, all those in whom he dwells. He only dwells in those who are born of the Spirit, born again. So when you hear people talk about born again Christianity, that's the idea whether or not they actually possess it or understand it. It's been greatly distorted because the natural man, the person who hasn't been regenerate, cannot understand these things, cannot see these things. As Jesus said, unless you're born again, you can't even behold, perceive the kingdom of God because it's spiritual. We don't change in outward appearance, but there's a definite change deep inside. Our own minds may not recognize what's happened, especially if we weren't raised uh, in a church or a group that that preached these things, like I wasn't. It's like I knew something happened, though. I knew God. I had a different. Re I knew I had a different relationship with God. And I would say that would be the best way to understand it because the idea of being born again has been so distorted that before that I knew because the Holy Spirit had convicted me of my sins, and your conscience does the same thing, by the way, that, that I was not right with God, that there was something called sin between me and God, lots of, lots of sins. And 
My heart wasn't right with him either. But then when he saved me, outside of a church building, by the way, all by myself, it just God and me, the Holy Spirit showed me that Jesus, revealed to me that Jesus died for my sins. And something happened. And my life changed. Not totally, not instantly, but there was an instant change in there, especially in my relationship with God. I certainly didn't become perfect through and through, I'll tell you that. Yeah. Yeah, we, we grow in the knowledge and grace in God. We, we don't, it's not instant perfectionism. That's just not true. Wishful thinking by people that didn't, <laughs> did not understand what they're talking about. Uh, but, not, not that it's a nice straight line, by the way. It is, there's a lot of bumps in the road. But it's, uh, it's the narrow way that Christ spoke of, not the broad way. Now, the second church, or the second Christianity, was begotten, let's say, roughly the year 325. Constantine. Constantine. Um, and there was, between real Christianity, between the New Testament and that time, Christianity was not on an upward climb. It was increasing in numbers, but it was also beginning to become somewhat corrupt. Uh, there was development of a distinction between the, uh, the clergy and the laity that doesn't exist in the New Testament. Uh, the the idea of pastors or elders, uh, or what's called bishops, which is the same thing, gradually began to uh, the idea of a a citywide bishop and local, and then you had pastors or elders underneath that. Uh, the priests and the bishop uh, began to take hold. Sacramentalism began to take hold. The idea that that a person became a Christian, a true Christian, by being dunked in water, uh, and that uh, gradually the some of the foundations of the uh, of the other uh, so-called uh, sacraments were began in, in embryonic form. And uh, even some of the the idolatry began to, to poke up a little bit here and there. The, the adulation of martyrs and Mary began to appear. That's all corruption. That's see the faith once delivered, once for all delivered. That that particular Greek word in the New Testament where it says in Jude, the faith delivered once uh, for the, unto the saints, means it was delivered and completed. That was it. That was that's all there is. See, we have the fullness of the revelation of New Testament Christianity in this book. The fullness of the revelation of Christ's purpose in this book, for this age. I mean, not the absolute fullness, but all that God has is going to reveal is revealed in here already. It's finished. It's completed. With the, the end of the apostles, that's it. So that's why the charismatic and Pentecostal movement are wrong. All these new prophets, they're all false prophets. See, uh, and Pentecost is not related to Pentecostalism and the Charismatic Movement. Different origins. One started in Topeka, Kansas. The other started in the year 1901, I believe it was, the, or 1900. And the other one began in Jerusalem in the year 30 or 33. 33, if you want to use the traditional dates. 33. Give or take a couple of years. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Almost 3,000 years, uh, 2,000 years ago. Almost 2,000 years ago. Very close now. So that was the beginning of the real church. And then 325, what happened then, uh, Emperor Constantine uh, and his co-emperors and stuff, that he had um, removed the penalties from Christianity. Christianity was regarded by that time, uh, was persecuted as being illicit. Uh, Judaism was accepted because it was an ancient religion. Christianity was new. Christianity was spreading. It wasn't connected to a people. 
uh, spreading among slaves especially, and in the, the nobility and other places. And it was, uh, it was uh, conceived, uh, thought of as being uh, seditious because Christians didn't worship the gods of the empire, especially the god known as Caesar. And that became a test of the Christians. Will they say, Caesar is Lord? And they would not. They would pray for Caesar. They would render Caesar obedience and everything that was lawful in the sight of God, but they would not call him Lord. And that's why many of them were died. That's how you identified them. You, were, you grabbed them and, and made them worship uh, Caesar burn a pinch of incense before an image and confess that Caesar is Lord, and they refused and died. See, uh, state religion and Christianity tend to be not always compatible. As long as the state is we'll leave us alone, we don't cause them problems. We don't try to overthrow the governments of this world. But uh, state the state tends to be totalitarian and and frightened and evil because they're not born again. They're fallen human beings in a fallen system that gets worse all the time. But Constantine had this problem. There was, uh, under paganism, there was nothing... Uh, the Roman, Roman Empire was big had all these different nations in it. What united them other than the power of the Roman legions? Nothing. They had trade. They had the Roman roads. But there was, there was nothing to unite them. That was the emperor worship was part of the, uh, the state cult. And, but most of these, these uh, you know, the idea that people would worship the empire, emperor, but that didn't bind people together. It certainly didn't bind their hearts together. There was, other than force and threats and certain benefits of the Roman Empire, uh, Pax Romana, if, at least if you were on the right side, and trade was beneficial for some people, the there there was nothing that held it together. It's like the United States today. What holds the United States together? Now, nada, nothing, nothing. The United States is very unstable, becoming more so, fragmenting, and it will. It'll fragment, and they'll just go to more and more power. They'll they'll use the the COVID kind of things, and then they'll the, you know how the United States is sanctioning. Uh, other countries around the world, they don't do what they tell them. Now, they, they've been doing that in the United States, too, under COVID. We've seen what the United States is really like. The government institutions are really like. They will use sanctions on people. Just like in Canada, they were the truckers, and they were saying, we're going to seize their bank accounts. We're going to seize their children. We're going to seize their pets. Trudeau. We've, we've seen that the leaders in so-called Western democracies are absolutely identical to people like Stalin and Hitler and Mao. Same, because they're all human beings. See, those weren't isolated cases. Those, you could take almost any person and put them in the same circumstances and get the same results. Following human nature. And the Bible reveals that Satan controls the whole world, all of natural humanity. They all lie in him, uh, uh, recline in him. So that's why you look at Washington. I look at Washington and I see Satan enthroned in the White House and in the Congress and in the courts because he is. That's, that's, this is a world in rebellion against the Creator. And Satan is a rebel angel. And he and perhaps a third of the angels followed him in his rebellion. And they control fallen humanity to a large degree behind the scenes. 
You wonder why all these things happen together and people say, oh, it's a conspiracy. Well, it, it might be a conspiracy, but it's not a conspiracy among human beings so much as behind the scenes. And that's why Satan, because he is not infinite, he's not God, he's attracted to structures of power. So when people build institutions, they're building a nest for the devil. And the bigger the nest, the more he likes it. <laughs> yeah, he'll take the biggest nest, he divvies the small ones out to his fallen companions. <sighs> it's just the way it is. Now, that may sound bizarre, but I would suggest if you look at the world, you'll see that uh, is how the world is. You know, Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is probably correct. How do you get a vast conspiracy to work? You can't. But if there's, if everyone, if the people in that they're involved in this are all fallen children of of Adam, and the the, the human race is essentially under the control of Satan because he rules by fear, by temp, by and by lust and by you know, the power, he, he t considered the temptations of Jesus. And are those any different than what he tempts every person with? And think about that. The only one that Jesus really didn't, didn't show up there was sexual temptation, but that has to do with the, the desires of the body and then the thirst and the hunger. Forty days without bread and water, perhaps, uh, you, you have more concerns on your mind than, than, than sexual gratification. <laughs> but uh, the, the, so the, the things that he tempts humanity with are, are the things that are, are, are sinful. That they're, they're selfish. The essence of sin, I think, is self-centeredness, selfishness. We were created to be the image of God. And to do that requires that living relationship with God because we can't be his image, truly, unless God is in us. So we're like the, the temples that make God visible. The bodies. Uh, what was that, that, that movie, Avatar? That's just not a good illustration, but God dwelling in his people in the midst of creation. That's what we're supposed to be, his, his image, his visible presence. More than simply a representative, because being in perfect harmony, Christ himself, Christ the man, in perfect harmony with God the Father. Except in a glorified state. So it's not just Christ the man, but see, that is God's purpose in humanity, his original purpose, and that's what he will accomplish. Which is why the millennial kingdom is necessary, by the way the visible, physical kingdom on earth to accomplish God's purpose, original purpose in creation, <laughs> visibly. It's not the Augustinian, everybody stands in heaven staring at God for eternity. God has all kinds of things planned. But Constantine needed that unity, and perhaps he had come to some faith in Christ. We don't know. Uh, you know, with politicians, you can never be. <laughs> you can't take their their statements as gospel. <laughs> but for the at least, uh, the, there was a purpose in bringing a coherence and a unity to the Roman Empire, something to bind it together. All these disparate peoples and nations. So, uh, Christian, he uh, with the Council of Nicaea. Uh, the, the he called the leaders of the Christian world together uh, to deal with the problem. And in doing that, he basically established a relationship between the Roman Empire, the state, and the church. And then the winning side in that particular conflict in the church was became the state church in a relatively short time. I mean, it was a development over um, approximately 50 years or 
or so after that. Uh, it was Constantine did not, contrary to some statements, he did not make Christianity the mandatory religion or the uh, official approved version of Christianity the mandatory religion. Uh, and out, he did not outlaw pagan worship. That was somewhat later, basically under Theodosius, is when that fully came about. But it uh, there was little bumps up and down in the way to that. But uh, that, in, under Theodosius, you have the, the complete state-church union, where the state is actually, the, the emperor is the head of the church. And... The old, and of course, at this time, uh, the the Roman Empire, the capital of the Roman Empire, was not in Rome. It was in Constantinople, Istanbul, what originally was called Byzantium. So that's where you had this state Christianity established. And state Christianity, one becomes a Christian by water baptism. Back then it was by immersion, and then gradually it got changed to sprinkling by the Catholics. The, the Orthodox still immerse because they're an older form of Christianity. Uh, they are the, the literal descendants of Constantine. The, the uh, Orthodoxy is Constantinian Christianity or, or uh, Theodosian Christianity sort of frozen about 1000 AD. Now in the West, Rome was abandoned pretty much. It became like Detroit. It's a big city in decay, rapid decay. Because all the important stuff, the government had moved. It had moved because Rome was too far into the hinterlands. They wanted to be more central. And uh, Constantinople was more a uh, more central and strategic location. So that's where Christianity moved. And it persisted there, the so-called Byzantine Empire, until the Muslims finally destroyed it in, what was it, 15, something or other. Finally took down the city. And so this that is state Christianity. We saw that in the West, too. Under Roman Catholicism, uh, Roman Catholicism was, there was no uh, central empire. It became the state, essentially, the papacy. And then, with jockeying back and forth with empire, with emperors, you know, it's like who's in control here? There was more interplay there. But basically, the papacy uh, had authority. And so that was the state form of Christianity, really. The Protestant Reformation came along, and things got more complicated and more complicated. But the Protestant churches... Uh, the magisterial Protestant churches, the, uh, the the Anglicans and the Lutherans and the Reformed, were all state churches. All of them. You had the, you had the Anabaptists, which were they sought to go back to the New Testament. They were hunted down and killed by the state and the state church. See, there's this... Because state Christianity is not spiritual, authentic Christianity. It is not. It, do, it cannot produce and provide a living relationship with God through faith in Christ. So it... Because the state is not of God. It's not God's creation. It, it's, you, you, to enter into that relationship with God requires an act of God, a miraculous act of God in you. It's a relationship directly between you and God, not through an institution. Now, state religion, state Christianity, is institutional Christianity. It's an institution of the state. It is, uh, you, you have the priesthood and the bishops and the patriarchs or the pa papacy. And that is, uh, and it's all connected 
with society. You could, you might say, that it is societal religion, a little bit like Old Testament Judaism. It's a societal religion, a binding together of sight, or, or in, in some ways, in Judaism and Israel. It's it's not real. Old Testament Judaism, it's not real, it's not a real relationship with God, but it is a thing that binds a society together, sort of, but doesn't really do it in Israel. It's it's a community, it, it binds a community together. Now, Christianity is bound together directly by the living presence of Jesus Christ in his people, the real Christianity. I have as I have as much in common with a believer a true believer in Moscow, in Russia, in uh, Kiev, in uh, uh, South Africa, Johannesburg, or in, in Tokyo, or in, in uh, whatever they call the capital of China nowadays, uh, or in Berlin, or, or in uh, Chicago, as I do with uh, a closer relationship than I do with a next-door neighbor that's not a Christian, or a family member that's not a born-again Christian. A much closer relationship, because it is Christ himself who binds us together, and he's not subject to localities. So. See, I, I can meet a, a born-again believer from any place that I've never met before, from around this world. And I've experienced this, and immediately I have fellowship with them. Immediately. We're brothers and sisters. It's amazing to experience that, and I have many times. That's real Christianity, and we, we, we possess one thing in common, Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God dwelling in us, the Spirit of Christ. He is our koinonia, our common possession, and that binds the real church of Jesus Christ together. Christ himself is our unity. He has nothing to do with skin color. has nothing to do with nationality. These people that make this big deal about uh, the, the woke stuff and skin color and everything else inside the church, they demonstrate they don't know what Christianity is. They are part of institutional Christianity. And that's a, uh, in the United States, there is not a state Christianity. But there is institutional Christianity, which basically comes from the same thing. It is, it is a Christianity built uh, by man through institutions. It has structure, man-made structures. Well, real Christianity doesn't need that. It's like during the pandemic, there was a, a, many, quite a few conservative Christians just going screaming bloody murder because they couldn't go to church in California. <laughs> well... Or here, in, in, now, Christianity is ruled by the, the love of God and the love of our brothers and sisters. Those are the primary commandments. Jesus said, love one another. He didn't mean love one another in general. Love your brothers and sisters in Christ. That, that is so confused. Because, well, that's part of the manifestation of this problem. But... As I thought about the issue, I mean, this was, of course, the, the COVID-19 was a, a novel virus. We wouldn't know, didn't know what it was going to do. We just had some bad data coming out of China and some worse projections coming out of England. Well, we know how much credibility to give the English now. <sighs> Computer projections. But you you know how just changing one variable just a tiny little bit in a, in a projection will do. People that don't know how to use computers, see you have to understand reality. Other you can't computer does they'll just tell do will do whatever you tell it to do. Don't it's bad. You can't make computer projections are worthless. Worthless. They're no more reliable than the programmer and the designer of the system. With sinful human beings. Uh, just amplifies their errors. But regardless, uh, I mean, as I considered that, I was thinking, well, you know, if love, Christian love. If I love my brothers and sisters, and there's a, and by my going, us assembling together, physically assembling together, 
under those circumstances, especially in modern, poorly ventilated buildings, singing hymns, which produce a lot of droplet splatter, I can testify to the visible evidence of that before me right now, with keyboard, black keyboards and little droplet splatters on them. Got yeah, a brand new keyboard, and I can see the, the marks on it. I've had to clean them several times in the last year. But talking loudly into a microphone, you know, you're, you're aspirating, and singing is worse. You really got those vo vocal cords uh, exhaling while you're speaking or, or uh, singing will just spray all over the place. So some of the those uh, anecdotal cases about things being spread in choir practice are probably true. So the love, especially if you don't know all the, the don't know the know the mortality rate, you're being told all kinds of bizarre numbers, usually the most inflated possible thing they can come up with. Uh, love would say you don't assemble together under in those in that situations you know indoors in a poorly ventilated building that uh you know the the newer buildings you can't even open the windows you know the old church buildings you open the windows on both sides and <laughs> let the wind blow through it'd be much safer um some of the th social distancing i mean it'd have some effect but but the idea that you you must meet together to satisfy some biblical injunction is absolutely false. People like John MacArthur, absolutely false. And those that follow him, absolutely false. There is no mandate to gather together. There is an in, uh, instruction in Hebrews that we ought not forsake the assembling together. But the context indicates that the purpose to assemble together is to love the brethren. That is the overriding commandment. Assembling together is just a means of that. So if if there is danger in assembling together, rather than benefit, if there's a manifest danger or a, certainly a high probability of danger, then love requires you not to do that in that way. So you look for you do things another way. You can gather together outdoors. You know, Christians have always done that. Improvise. Overcome. Uh, it's not a problem. God's wisdom. The wisdom, God, if you belong to Christ, he'll give you the wisdom. We have the mind of Christ. He'll tell us how to do it. Now, these people are, they're, they're more connected to state religion. See, state has these institutions, these buildings, these structures. This, this, the priesthood, whether it's Protestant priesthood or, or a Roman Catholic priesthood or an Orthodox priesthood, it doesn't matter. These, the, the, the sacraments, and it was this, this institutional Christianity requires your attendance, demands your attendance. And in state religion, to not be part of that is to be against the society which is why the Anabaptists were burned at the stake or drowned or all kinds of things, because they did not participate in this mandatory state cult that had a political function to unify society. Now, state Christianity is not a, a Christianity that is real Christianity, but it, it, it does have a, an edifying effect for a country because the morality and the commandments of the Scripture gives a transcendent, uh, and, a, and a, the identity of Christianity gives a meaning to society that is not present in the United States or in Western Europe anymore. Poland, I don't know where they're going. Um, Hungary is hopeful there. I have some hope for Hungary. But so there can be a, a beneficial aspect to having Christianity as a foundation for society 
But there's a danger there, too, if it gets wedded in to, to, uh, to the government and becomes an institution. As long as you can make the distinction between, between societal Christianity and biblical spiritual Christianity, you're okay. It's interesting that uh, the structural Christianity in uh, the uh, institutional Christianity in both the East and the West tended to make provisions for real Christians. They they made them into monks or hermits or something. <laughs> yes, you know, we we recognize you're different and more spiritual. Uh, so we need, we need to put you away because you're a threat. Uh, find some place we can. We can send you where you can do something and you won't be a threat to the institution. Because real Christianity doesn't need the institution. It's just like I was talking about the, the COVID thing and probably didn't complete my thought. I don't need the the church building and the, the organizations and those things because my relationship is personal with Jesus Christ with God through Christ, as is every brother and sister of mine. All their, all of them, my spiritual brothers and sisters, have a genuine personal relationship with God through Christ. He dwells in them, and he dwells in me, and that is his church. We are all his church, and we all have an utterly intimate relationship with each other because it depends on our relationship with him. His, he dwells in every one of us. So, you know, for us not to assemble together, say, in a, a bad building under bad uh, pandemic is an act of love. It's an act of worship. It's not what we necessarily do, but we, we uh, would want to do. But we're willing to do that because we love one another and don't want to put each other at risk. And that's always been my position. I mean, I eventually got vaccinated with a one-shot thing. Not because I wanted it necessarily, but because of others. But it turns out it really didn't accomplish that purpose, which is why I have not got, got boosted, and I'm not going to get any more of these vaccines. Because unless they prevent infection and prevent transmission, they're useless, as far as I'm concerned. I'm not interested in whether they reduce my risk of mortality. I've got God. They can keep their, their, their plunger. I've got God. I don't put my faith in medicine. I put my faith in God. Now, so it's just a matter of also they're becoming such a hassle. Eh, I don't really care. It's not worth fighting about. But I haven't bothered with these stupid boosters because there is no legitimate purpose for me to get them. If you're concerned about your own mortality and you trust in, in medicine and science, go ahead. I don't care. So I'm not telling you not to. Where is your faith? Besides, what's the worst can happen to me? If COVID would kill me? Hallelujah. I'm home. It's see, a real Christian has a different view of death. We're not going to hell. You ought to be afraid if you're not born again. That in fact the Bible says that Satan keeps all his children, all the world, under him through he he, he controls them through the fear of death. Uh, so these are these two systems. The, one, the real Christianity is the creation of God in Jesus Christ. The institutional or state Christianity is the creation of man. And they can overlap. That's where it gets confusing. That's where I have a problem. Because, you know, I like things to be black or white, right or wrong. And, and when you have this overlap, things can get grayish. Not, there's not the clarity there. So, With the Anabaptists, there was clarity. If, if they catch us, they're going to kill us. Um, and that's going to happen again. 
in the United States, and in Canada, too, probably. Well, probably in Canada first. Already, if you have a Christian worldview and you're outspoken about it, they'll cancel you or they'll imprison you. They'll call it hate speech when it's really love speech. See, when you tell people they're sinful and they're going to hell, but God provides salvation, that's not hatred. If you hated them, you wouldn't tell them. You wouldn't tell them the truth. Why, why go out of your way to preach salvation to the lost if you hate them? Just be a Calvinist. <laughs> then you can hate them with a clear conscience. I don't want to get into that. I probably offended some people. Oh, well, I don't have any subscribers to speak of anymore. Uh, that, that's a rabbit trail. Just, just let it pass if it bothers you. I'm not going to explain it now. But you have these two forms of Christianity, the, 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 that which is made by God and that which is made by man. And as we've noticed, in the, like the last three popes have been quite explicit about that, they take a dim view of biblical Christianity because we don't need their institutions. The, the idea that a, uh, that a person would have a personal relationship with God, they think that's dangerous. Why? Because we don't need them. We don't need the priesthood. We don't need their sacraments. We don't need their baptism. We don't need any of that stuff because that's all... Uh, now I, I, I don't, don't want to discount some of that stuff completely because that was... But there's, there's, see, there's this overlap. Uh, God instituted baptism and communion, the, the visible, visible aspects of it, as aids. They're not the essence, though. They're not the spiritual essence of it. Jesus doesn't physically turn into bread and wine, okay? And water doesn't really wash away your sins. It's, that real, it's what God does in that relationship. It is a visible aid to the reality which is spiritual and invisible. It has purposes, but it's not the essence of it. It is not essential. That relationship with God is essential. So because we have a direct relationship, we don't have to go to, the, to a priest. Going to a priest for confession, you've got to be kidding me. I'm probably going to a guy today, according to Catholics, I'm probably going to be confessing my sins to a homosexual. Really? So, physician, heal thyself. When you can prove to me that you put away your sins, that, you, that you're sanctified, that you have been set free through faith in Christ from your bondage to sin, then maybe I'll go talk to you. But until then, what do you have to give me? Except lies. See, institutional Christianity, state Christianity, can pronounce you forgiven, but it can't actually forgive you. It has no authority to do it. Because it's, it's man's creation, it's man's institutions. And institutions, well, they are inherently a problem. They become, because they are centers of power, they become corrupt and they attract fallen angels too because the devil wants authority he wants he, he can't exercise authority over every human being directly so he builds systems to exercise authority perhaps your smartphone is part of that system perhaps the internet is because he can't actually speak to people universally so he has to build systems. Man builds the systems and Satan uses, manipulates the people. People say, oh, George Soros. No, he's just a servant of Satan. Joe Biden is a slave of Satan. Satan controls him through fear, fear of death. And other things, greed, lust, <laughs> the, the uh, desire for the smell of little girl's hair. Ay, caramba. And democracy is an evil institution, too, because it allows people like Biden to get into power. 
that see that it, it's it's a testimony. It's judge. God should judge America simply because they elected Biden. They demonstrated what that they are ungodly. Not that we didn't ha we had a good choice, but better not to vote at all in some circumstances. Uh, maybe I should have taken that choice the last election. It wouldn't have made any difference. That's been my historic pattern to realize that that elections can't change things because they. This is really a side issue, but because the institutions don't change. That's why electing a different president, as Trump found out. He went in there, he told everybody he's going to drain the swamp. That's why he got elected. The swamp is bigger than Trump. The swamp is permanent. See, government institutions tend to be permanent. You can't get rid of them. You can't get rid of them. They, they become, once it becomes an institution... See, this is why denominations become bad, too. They have institutional structures, and the more structures you have, the more, the bigger a nest for the devil you're building. Because real Christians don't need the institutions, and we don't want the institutions. Those are made by man. So it's like, you know, you, oh, you need institutions to send missionaries out. No, you don't. No, you don't. The New Testament didn't need them. If the New Testament church didn't need it, we don't need it either. But people don't believe that because they don't believe the Bible, because they don't know God. But that's, that's uh, now like in Russia, Putin has been re emphasizing the historic Russian identity uh, being connected to the Orthodox faith. Not that it's a state church there. It's just favored by the state. It's sort of like under Constantine. Uh, Christianity, uh, a particular particular segment of Christianity, was favored by Constantine, favored with money and buildings. And things. That's basically what Putin's doing. Um, not that that's necessarily bad as far as a societal, as far as, as a, uh, a leader of a nation, that includes more than born again Christians. See, this is this is where this issue gets really muddy for those of us who are born again Christians, because the good of a society depends on that glue of religion, and of course, a, a religion that's close to biblical Christianity that that at least acknowledges the authority of the Scripture, acknowledges the authority of Christ and the apostles and the the uh, Ten Commandments, is much better than a society that doesn't. So we were, <laughs> but yeah, we we can recognize the dangers of this relationship too, because state Christianity tends to attract people that are not born again to leadership because that's the nature of a fallen man. Real Christians don't want those things, those responsibilities. We'll only do it as, you know, like, oh, Lord, please don't put me in that place. And, uh, but you, you have, it's, it's, it's like we, we saw this problem in England with the Puritans uh, under King James, uh, the you had a state church, the, the Anglican church, under the king. And then you had others that, that wanted a real church, the the real sort of what they imagined the church to be. So you had the pilgrims, you had different groups, uh, separatist groups, because they, they thought the state church was corrupt. And it was. It was. They recognized it, it wasn't biblical Christianity. So you have this... So they didn't want to meet with that. But then the, the king looks at that and says, hey, I've got people down there that are, are not partaking in this form of Christianity that holds the country together. So you've got this this situation. Uh, real Christianity probably thrives best when we're being persecuted, but it's, it's, it's not as complicated. But as far as society in general, you're better to have... A knowledge of God, uh, even if it's not uh, a really good one, then no knowledge at all. Maybe. I might be wrong on that. I might be wrong on that one. Uh, 
and, and that becomes very confusing for those of us who, who live in two kingdoms. Our bodies in one and our, our, our hearts and my, our soul, our spirit are someplace else. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ. Our citizenship is in Christ. And the world, rulers of the world, look at that and say, what do you mean you won't call me Lord? And I said, no, you're not Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. If you bow down to Jesus Christ, you're fine with me. <laughs> do what's right in the sight of God. I won't cause you any problems, but uh, they, they have the idea that they want to be God. They want to be in charge. They don't like people that don't accept their 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 uh, the authority that they've stolen that doesn't really belong to them. And of course, as Christians, we're told to to subject ourselves. There's a long message on that to those in authority in the world to to put ourselves under. Uh, to, to not rise up in rebellion. In other words, obey them when possible <laughs> for the Lord's sake and for each other because we, we, we're told to, to be, as far as possible, live in peace with all men. We look at the United States government and say, I don't want to be part of this. This world, uh, tonight, nowadays, the United States, as far as I can see, has become the center of evil in the world. The center of evil is in Washington, D.C. Satan is enthroned there. And he's up to no good. The United States is up to no good. The institutions of government and the presidency, and the person that's in there, Satan's got his man there. And the people around him. And Congress are absolutely corrupt. Okay, but I'm going to st stop this video now. It's one hour. And I think I'll uh, go on a little bit on that on a separate video. But uh, there's two Christianities again. You have the, the real, biblical, born-again, born-of-the-spirit, personal relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ Christianity uh, that... The, the the Christianity of the apostles, of the New Covenant, of the New Testament. Real Christianity. And then you the life-transforming Christianity, the Christianity that sets you free from slavery to sin. And then you have the, the institutional state type of Christianity. In the United States, a little bit odd because it's uh, institutional, but not doesn't not have a... Uh, uh, monopoly, but a, a societal Christianity as a as a unifying foundation uh, and glue for society, which is you could call Constantinianism, uh, Christianity that serves that purpose, and they can serve both, but it's it's tricky and touchy because the the institutional stuff makes false claims. <laughs> it's not the real thing. And the real Christians will make that plain, say, hey, wait a minute. Your priest can't actually forgive sins. <laughs> I mean, some of these false, these institutions that are connected with it uh, are problematic for real Christians, for God. <laughs> It's not, it's not real Christianity. It serves a social purpose, but it's not real Christianity. It doesn't save people, which is why Christ came to the world, to save sinners, not to build a society, not to build better governments, but to save sinners. And institutional Christianity doesn't do that because it can't, and it wants to build societies, build structures, build institutions. Because it's of this world, it's of man. I hope that uh, helps some people out there to clarify as much as you can this problem we see throughout history. And today, we have the same thing existing today. We have institutional, societal Christianity. Not so much state religion uh, as it once was, but... Uh, 
a, a Christianity that serves a, a, a human purpose, an institutional purpose, a, a unifying purpose, as opposed to real Christianity, which truly unifies God's people. As I said, it doesn't matter what color your skin is, where you come from, what language you speak. If we would happen to meet together, even if we couldn't communicate, we would know each other intimately because we have a common possession in each of us. Our unity is Christ himself living in us. We are the church. And the institutional church is not, even though some of us might be in institutional church assemblies. But there's a difference, there's a distinction. We are from above, they are from below. We are of the kingdom of God, they are of this world. And that always separates us. But we have true communion with those who have Christ in them. So it might clarify, it might cause more confusion, I think. I don't know. God bless you.